My name's Greg Benfield. In this presentation, I'm going to talk you through some key ideas about improving the effectiveness of assessment and feedback. I'll have to leave it to you to decide how to interpret these ideas in relation to your context, the subject you teach, the department and institution you're in, whether or not your course is delivered primarily by face-to-face -face methods or substantially online or a mixture of both. These are the intended learning outcomes for the session. We focus on current issues in assessment and feedback and on some practical issues for your teaching. Many of the ideas in this presentation are from the work of the ASK Centre for Excellence in Teaching and Learning. I'd especially urge you to read this book by ASK on the topic if you want to delve into some of those ideas more deeply. Let's start with the question or the notion of assessment criteria. Starting probably in the late 1990s, there was a big push in higher education to improve assessment standards by making assessment criteria explicit. No doubt you're familiar with the type of criteria grid shown on this slide. Before this time, this type of thing was quite rare. The core idea is that if you can clarify and write down the criteria on which a piece of student work will be assessed, then this should help to improve intermarker reliability and it should also help to improve student learning by making clear to students the qualities that will be looked for in their work. Clearly this notion is only going to work if the assessment criteria that one develops for a given assignment are closely related to the learning outcomes of the course as a whole. Equally clearly, students need to know about the criteria before they begin working on their assignments or they can't know what to aim for. Now, colleagues here at Brooks, Chris Rust, Margaret Price and Barry O'Donovan in particular, researched the impact of a large-scale implementation of explicit assessment criteria in the business school at Brooks over three or four years in the early 2000s. And they found that although students appreciated knowing the assessment criteria, there was no significant improvement in student achievement as a result. If you think about it, this makes sense. As subsequent work by these colleagues and others has shown, understanding how to interpret and apply assessment criteria is very complex. We academics gain and refine our understanding of the criteria we use in practice by marking a wide variety of student work using those criteria. In the process, we're exposed to a wide range of responses to the same issue or problem. It follows that students will only gain an understanding of assessment criteria through a similar process of engaging with those criteria in actual marking exercises. For example, in increasingly many modules at Oxford Brooks, we do marking exercises using sample pieces of student work. Students are given some sample pieces of work to mark in their own time, and in a subsequent workshop or seminar, they discuss their marks and compare them with the actual tutor marks given. This helps students to gain a richer understanding of what we mean when our assessment criteria refer to things like critical analysis or using evidence, to name just a couple of examples of things that might be interpreted very differently in, di in different subjects, different tasks, and at different levels. Okay, we turn now to some definitions. Frequently we, we refer to two basic kinds of assessment in higher education. Formative assessment, which is now often referred to as assessment for learning. This is assessment whose essential purpose is helping students to learn. Formative assessment usually doesn't have marks attached to it, although it might. Summative assessment, now often referred to as assessment of learning, is assessment whose primary purpose is to judge how much is being learnt. Summative assessment usually comes at the end of a period of learning. It focuses on judging performance, on grading, on differentiating between students, and it usually carries marks. Now, one of the things that the research is very clear about is that summative assessment tends to be of limited or even no use for feedback on learning. 
Now, if a course has an overemphasis on summative assessment, then a series of consequences might follow. Too many high-risk assessments might encourage students to adopt surface or strategic approaches to their learning. They may encourage students to adopt an atomized approach to each assessment so that they fail to make the links between what they've learned before and what they're trying to do now. An overemphasis on summative assessment can encourage students to play it safe or to avoid risk taking. As I've already mentioned, summative assessments tend not to provide useful feedback. And especially early in a course, failure can seriously damage self-efficacy. And of course, overemphasizing summative assessment can also be time consuming for staff. In general, in higher education, we need to shift the balance of assessment more away from summative and towards formative assessment, towards assignments whose purpose, main purpose anyway, is to help students learn and give them feedback. Studies consistently point to assessment and especially feedback as being the area students across the sector are most dissatisfied with in their experience at university. Yet there's an abundance of research going back many decades showing the importance of feedback to learning. This slide and the next one point to a few of these. Learners need effective feedback in order to learn. We also know that students who are struggling in their courses for whatever reason have the most to gain from improvements to our feedback processes. A slide two slides back contained a quote saying students are hungry for feedback. Yet many teachers are familiar with the phenomenon of stacks of uncollected work representing hours and hours of carefully constructed feedback sitting outside their offices until they're eventually thrown away. This apparent paradox is an expression of the complexity of feedback processes. There are a variety of well-documented problems with feedback. This slide gives you some of them and some papers to follow up on regarding some of the dimensions of these problems. For example, why don't students read their feedback? Well, often this is not carelessness or lack of motivation. Frequently, students have very good reasons for not paying attention to it. We know, for example, that many students are only interested in the mark. They may believe that the feedback on this assignment will not be able to help them on any subsequent assignments, and sometimes they can be quite right about that. If they've frequently received feedback in the past that has been unhelpful, then this will also colour their attitude to subsequent feedback. Here are some further examples from the student perspective of why students may not regard feedback as being helpful. Things like being difficult to read or uninterpretable because they're in some kind of shorthand are obvious. And these are also relatively easy to, to address, particularly through the use of electronic feedback. Similarly, having to wade through a mass of information about what you've done wrong or badly is unlikely to motivate you to think about how to improve. But what I think is most important about this slide is the idea that we should not consider written feedback as a product sufficient and in and of itself. If a student doesn't understand a concept, there's no reason to think that even the most carefully crafted paragraph or two is going to fix that. Feedback needs to be thought of as part of a process, a dialogue. If we see feedback in this way, then we can stop investing so much time in trying to construct the perfect written feedback and concentrate more on highlighting for students the areas in their work that need to improve and facilitating ways to discuss those areas with them in more detail. I want to recommend these seven principles of good feedback practice by Nicol and McFarlane Dick. They're based on an extensive review of literature and provide a simple framework in which to evaluate feedback practice. The paper is very accessible and gives good examples of how to use the principles to evaluate different kinds of assessment activities for the power of feedback processes that they involve. Okay, so what can we do to improve feedback processes? Well, here are some ideas. We might concentrate on managing expectations. Frequently, there can be a mismatch between our intentions in giving feedback to students and the students' expectations of that feedback.
for example. Sometimes we might just want to highlight one or two generalized areas for improvement that would be important subsequently in similar assignments. Other times we may want to give more detailed feedback specific to this particular piece of work. Students can only detect and understand such different purposes if we're explicit about them. In other words, if we precede our feedback by saying something like, in this feedback I will only comment on the two most important areas for further development, and so on. We can also help ourselves by noting that students frequently don't recognise feedback when it's occurring. So we can do things like say, my feedback to you on this is, in a classroom discussion say, so that they become more alert to the wide variety of informal feedback mechanisms that they experience. And we can work on the idea of encouraging students to read and use their feedback by requiring them to do so. For example, having them comment on how they've used the feedback from an earlier draft in their final coursework. Very quickly then, here are some summary ideas about how to ensure feedback is fit for purpose. First, when designing a formative assessment especially, try to ensure that students have motive, opportunity and means to use feedback. Motive derives from a belief that the feedback will be of use in another piece of work. Opportunity comes from a subsequent task, perhaps a similar piece of work or another draft of this one, in which they can actually apply the suggestions given in the feedback. So if, there's, if this is not a draft, one will need to point out to students the following pieces of work where they may need to use this feedback. Means is the tricky one. It's about providing opportunities and time to discuss and understand how to act on the feedback given. Having a formative first draft stage followed by a final submission is a classic way of structuring to achieve this. Furthermore, we can devote precious marking time to providing feedback at the formative stage and just give the mark for the summative submission in this sort of uh, structure. As I said earlier, we should consider alternatives to written feedback, which can be time consuming to create. Oral feedback, including recorded audio feedback, might be more effective because it can be more personal and can address motivational and affective issues more easily than written feedback. We should find ways to encourage classroom discussion about assignments, for example through using marking exercises with exemplar assignments and the class marking criteria and through peer review. It's also important to help students make links between the assignments they do in our modules and those they're going to do subsequently. This means we need to be alert to a program view of assessment and to explain to students how the feedback we give them on assignments is relevant to other assignments they will do in other parts of their course. Pay careful attention to what's feasible in the feedback you're giving. Sometimes it's a complete waste of time writing anything other than something like please see me about this, or you need to practice this more, so please do visit the following website where you'll find more exercises to do. Sometimes quick and dirty feedback is more effective than very detailed feedback. Generic feedback, where at the very next opportunity after they have submitted their work, you tell students, your assignments had the following strengths and weaknesses. Did your work contain any of these? can be very helpful and also encourage students' self-assessment ability. Regular computer-aided assessments can provide important, timely guidance to students about their understanding of course content, course skills and concepts. And finally, think about whether to withhold marks for a while and only give students the mark that after they've had time to concentrate on the feedback. Okay. I hope you found this useful. Here's a little checklist of practical things you might do to improve your own feedback practice. Pause the video here if you want to think about it or make notes. There are two slides of references cited in this presentation. Pause the video on each one if you want to follow up on something. 
Bye for now.